In 2006, financial commentator Peter Schiff successfully predicted the subprime mortgage crisis of 2007, which effectively led to the global financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. When his predictions came true, Peter arose a star of economic forecasting. Since then, he has issued dozens of other apocalyptic predictions, and most of them failed quite spectacularly. You know what they say, even a stopped clock is right twice a day. But is it also true, then, that most economic forecasters are only right once in a lifetime? You can't become financially successful without planning for the long term. But what if, and that's a big if in itself, you have it all figured out, but suddenly you realize that your overall income has gone down and everything has become more expensive and the prices of the assets you've invested in are suddenly plummeting. And you think, if only there were some apostles of true economic knowledge that would bless you with the gift of reliable information, preferably in bite-sized bullet points you can read from your phone, perhaps while otherwise occupied in the bathroom. In this video, I'll try to answer the questions you might have about economic forecasts. How are they made? Are they legitimate and based on data, or is it just fortune-telling? <laughs> Why do they fail? And finally, how can they help you with your financial decisions? Economic forecasting has a long history. In fact, the ancient Egyptians used to predict each year's GDP based on the water level of the Nile. The water levels affected the harvest, which was about 90% of their GDP. In the 17th century, the English economist Sir William Petty introduced the idea of a business cycle, during which the economy would go through periods of growth and recession. This concept of boom and bust has been a main staple of economic analysis and forecasting ever since. But you might ask, why is the boom and bust cycle so important? Well, obviously, if we know at which point of the cycle we are at the moment, and when the current period of boom or bust is going to end, we can predict what our best financial strategy should be for the near future. I'll come back to specific advice a bit later. Now it's best to explain how the cycle actually works in the first place. How does the economy function as a whole? Well, one thing that's important to keep in mind, the ratio of supply and demand in it is constantly changing. Say you have a successful, rapidly developing business with a touch of novelty. In other words, a strip club. During a boom period, clients have a lot of disposable income and they create high demand for your services. It's easy for you to get a bank loan at a favorable rate, attract new investors and open up a second floor. Later, you can even expand your chain of clubs to other cities. And that's always nice. High revenues allow you to pay out good dividends to banks and investors and pay good money to the strippers. This is important. Of course, you get a lot of competition, but there's enough clientele for everyone. Everything looks perfect, and you think, why can't this last forever? Well, as the amount of money in the economy grows, it becomes cheaper. In other words, there's inflation, and that's when the government steps in. The Federal Reserve raises the key rate, which is the interest rate at which banks can borrow money from it. Banks, in turn, raise the interest rate for consumers, which makes money more expensive. As a result, the clients are less and less eager to spend their money in your club, as well as the competing ones. Oh dear. The demand goes down, there's less money in the economy, and their value rises, so the inflation goes down. Now you have to compete for a smaller pool of clients, and to win this fight, you lower the prices, optimize your staff, and even make a deal with your conscience. Rent out part of your premises to a local reformed church preacher for his daily sermons. Soon enough, the ALP, by which I mean the average lap dance price, falls to record lows. Less successful clubs go out of business and strippers lose their jobs. What a pity. So, we're in a bust, but how does it switch back to a boom? Now naturally, less competent clubs have closed down and their former employees have registered at OnlyFans, which, to be fair, was a better option from the start. You work from your couch and you get paid better. Trust me. Uh, oh no. 
The government's intervention has helped take inflation under control, but a decline in income and rising unemployment is hardly a basis for further economic growth, so the Federal Reserve lowers the key rate again. Loans become affordable for consumers and businesses, the demand goes up, and soon enough it outstrips the supply again. But at the same time, your strip club, which survived thanks to the dirty money from the preacher, gets more opportunities for development. There's less competition, and also you can hire strippers and staff which have been made redundant by the others. All of that creates a platform for a new economic boom. So how can modern economic forecasting help you with your financial decisions? Now, reputable forecasting companies, such as, for example, Oxford Economics, analyze the business data, stock and commodity prices, government policies, levels of water in the Nile. Yes, that too. It's very important to try and predict pretty much the same thing as before. Are we in a boom or in a bust? How strong is it? And how long will it last? For example, if the GDP is growing by at least 2 to 3% a year, people's real income is going up. The unemployment levels are low and the industrial production and sales are also growing. The inflation is no more than 2% a year and we can say we're in a period of economic growth or a boom. If a relatively long boom period seems to be ahead, people will be able to spend more money on goods so you can, for example, expand your business, get bank loans, make relatively risky or even speculative investments. But of course, you should always remember that the boom is not going to last forever. So when the money is plenty, it's best to save, say, 10% of your income as future reserve. On the other hand, when a drop in GDP, employment rate, and industrial production in sales is continuing for more than two quarters in a row, we can talk about a full-blown recession. And you might ask, what is there to do when the recession is looming? Should you sit on your money with a rifle, not talk to anyone, and reuse your tea bags? Not exactly. However, the financial behavior must change when the crisis is ahead. It's better not to take out new loans, but rather concentrate on repaying the existing ones. Favor conservative investment like government bonds over riskier ones, although it's not a good idea to panic sell your existing assets, whatever they might be. Cut your monthly spending, and of course, it's recommended to have an emergency fund in a safe place. That's what you've been saving for. Might I recommend, under the mattress in the guest room of your grandmother's house is not the best place. Put it inside the mattress and sew it closed up tight. <laughs> Just kidding, but not really. So yes, the forecasts are based on facts, data, and statistics. But why do they sometimes fail so spectacularly? Well, firstly, the main difference between, say, a weather forecast and an economic forecast is that the former doesn't affect the weather, but the latter does affect the economics. Even when the government didn't regulate the market that much, forecasters could still influence human psychology. A forecaster might, for example, have said, the stock market is going to crash and a crisis will follow. Some people believe it, start selling their stocks, and then others start following suit, and by the end of the year, the market naturally crashes spectacularly. For example, one of the most successful forecasters of the early 20th century, Roger Babson, is often blamed for the stock market crash of 1929, which was one of the first triggers of the Great Depression. When he predicted the crash, on the very same day, the stock market fell by 3% and just kept falling ever since. That became known as the Babson break. On the other hand, now the situation could also be completely opposite. An economist analyzes all the data correctly and predicts that next year the GDP will fall by 3%, which would be a disaster. His report is taken to the Ministry of Finance. They conclude it's accurate and take measures to prevent it from happening. So it turned out the forecaster was wrong. Or was he? You see what I mean? And also, there is one more teeny tiny reason why forecasts can fail. It is naturally the global existential unpredictability of our very existence. Well, almost. 
to be more clear, I'm talking about highly improbable events which we cannot predict, even though they might have global consequences. Like if suddenly a war breaks out, or someone eats a bat, or both, and not necessarily in that order. A writer and former trader Nassim Taleb calls such events black swans, because for millennia people didn't think black swans existed, and even used the expression black swan as an example of something that doesn't <laughs> exist. And then, at the end of the 17th century, they find out that black swans were actually living in Australia this whole time, running around without a care in the world. If we take our previous example of your fictional strip club and then imagine that in an instant everyone is forced to say, for example, wear masks, gloves, and take medical tests, well, your business might be forced to close very soon, no matter what stage of the boom or bus cycle you're in. Do such black swan events devalue the whole concept of forecasting then? Well, of course not. Is it possible to predict them? Well, you shouldn't count on it, because what you think of as highly improbable might look very differently from another point of view. Christmas is a black swan for a turkey, but it isn't for a butcher, because it's the turkey that doesn't know what's coming. So to sum up, economic forecasts are based on a lot of legitimate data and scientific methodology, and you should definitely keep them in mind before making important financial decisions. But it's always important to make your own research as well and learn financial behavior that can be sustainable to shocks and unexpected events. You can find some useful links to materials about forecasting in the video description below. Like this video and subscribe to the channel and I'll keep the new content coming. Cheers, see you later and goodbye.